This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. My guest today is Master Sergeant Courtney Weiser of the Vermont Army National Guard, who is going to be explaining some of the projects and opportunities uh, for service uh, with the National Guard and how people can get in touch with them uh, to find out more about it. And first of all, uh, Master Sergeant, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so thank you for the introduction, Dennis. Uh, my name is Master Sergeant Courtney Weiser. I joined the Vermont Army National Guard when I was 17. Um, I grew up in Swanton, Vermont. I graduated from Missisquoi Valley Union High School. I played hockey, soccer, and golf. Um, so graduated from there when I was 17, and I also joined the National Guard that same year um, before I graduated high school. And my reason for joining was, you know, military service was tradition in my family. So my dad was actually in the Vermont Army National Guard. My brother was also in the Vermont Army National Guard. Both of my grandfathers were in the Navy. So it was something that kind of ran in my family. Um, but most notably, my brother had deployed twice to Iraq um, before I was a senior in high school. So I felt like I wanted to give back um, and kind of do something that, you know, he would be proud of. Um, so in 2009, he and I both actually deployed to Afghanistan together. He was a medic and I was a diesel mechanic. Um, and since then, so went on deployment, came back. I finished my degree. I have a Bachelor of Science in Marketing. Um, and I'm now currently a recruiting supervisor. So I have 13 production recruiters that work for me. Um, and I have two kiddos and my husband is also in the Navy. So that's kind of where I'm at now in life. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for your service. Uh, yeah. It's most appreciated by, by everyone uh, in, in this state. And uh, thank your husband as well. Um, thank you, sir. And just if you could give us a little background, a history of the Vermont National Guard. Also, a lot of people might be confused as to what is uh, National Guard reserves uh, in contrast to uh, this, the regular army. I'm just using the vernacular yeah. regular army because you're all in the army, but maybe you can explain what that's about too. Yeah, so, you know, um, the National Guard is the oldest branch, right, because we were the original militia, um, the Minuteman, right? That's our that's our logo that we wear proudly. Um, but, you know, what separates us from active duty is, you know, first you have big army, right? And they're kind of the umbrella. And then you have the National Guard, reserve, and active duty under that umbrella, what separates us from the reserve component, which is who people usually get us confused with, because we're both part-time service, the National Guard is specific to the state. So the governor of Vermont can activate us, um, which the reserve component, he cannot do that. Um, the, the National Guard is also here for times of natural disaster. So when you see things on the news about you know major flooding, like the floods that happened in Montpelier, that was our soldiers out there helping, you know, helping people evacuate their houses, bringing fresh, uh, fresh water and food, all of those kinds of things. That's what the National Guard does. Another one that people um, saw a lot of the National Guard for was COVID. So we were actually the ones that went and built the hospital at the Expo Center. That was actually our, our army band. Um, we have a band here in the Vermont Army National Guard and they were the ones who went out and built the hospital. Another big one that a lot of people don't know about um, is our cyber unit. So when UVM got hacked, um, it was actually our cyber unit that went in and helped them get rid of the hackers and rebuild their infrastructure. So those are just some of the things that we, as the Vermont Army National Guard do. Um, the reserve component, they don't help in those uh, times of natural disaster because they're really to supplement active duty on deployments, um, which is something that we also do. We also go on deployments as well. So as I mentioned previously, we did deploy to Iraq a couple of times in the early 2000s to Afghanistan. 
more recently, we've deployed to Kuwait, Horn of Africa, um, Germany, Kosovo. So we send soldiers there as well. Um, once every five years ish is kind of our deployment cycle that can vary largely based on the needs of big army, right? If they need our help, then once every five years, we can go. If they don't need our help, then we get to stay here in Vermont. Great. Can you give us an idea of the numbers? Uh, how many members uh, are there and where uh, you are all based? Yeah, so currently we've got about 1,800 soldiers in the Vermont Army National Guard, and we're based all over the state. So if you, we have a, an armory in Swanton, Vermont, and then as far down south as Bennington. So we're kind of everywhere. Some of our armories are tucked away in, you know, uh, uh, smaller communities. And then we also have, you know, here in Colchester at Camp Johnson, we also have a big facility. So, but we are spread across the state and that's to make sure that, you know, we have access to all different parts of the state. And this year, uh, starting in January, what, what activities ha has the Guard been involved with locally or, or internationally? Yeah, so this year, one of the biggest things that we've done most recently is we just sent um, some of our medics and doctors over to Senegal. And they're actually doing what's called a MedRex, which is a medical exercise where we're helping provide humanitarian aid and medical services to um, the citizens in Senegal. So what that is, it's a part of what we call our SPP, our State Partnership Program. We have Austria as a part of that program, Senegal as a part of that program, and Macedonia. They're basically our sister countries that we're assigned to, and we do a lot of cross training. So they'll send their soldiers here to do training with us and vice versa. Um, and, you know, with our medics, our medics are over there right now, one learning from, you know, their doctors there, but also showing them, you know, some of our latest and greatest technologies and um, ways that we provide treatment. So since January, that would be one of the top things that we've done. Interesting. Again, give us an idea. Uh, we will get into the recruiting aspects later on, but what is the average time of service uh, for the Vermont National Guard? Or do people just go in for deployments? Or give us an idea of the time structure. Okay. So usually, well, not usually, every time somebody enlists into the Vermont Army National Guard or an, any branch for that matter, it's always eight years that you have to commit. But you can break up that eight years in different ways. So our most common contract length is what they call a six by two contract. So that's six years where they go to drill one week in a month, two weeks in the summer. Again, there is a potential for a deployment in there if that's you know in the deployment cycle, but they have to serve those six years, go to drill, go to their annual training for the two weeks in the summer. And then the final two years, if they don't want to re-enlist, then they go into a pool of applicants that basically they're waiting. If they're, if, before they enact the draft, they're waiting in that pool and they can get recalled to help supplement either active duty or the National Guard. So most people though, most people end up re-enlisting so that they never have to go into that pool. Most people will re-enlist. Um, we do offer re-enlistment bonuses because what we've learned is that it costs a lot of money to send people to training and we don't wanna lose that knowledge, right? Um, because they've got all of the experience after six years of doing their job um, and all of the schools that they've been sent to, we don't wanna lose them, right? So retention is really important to us. So most people will stay for at least 20 years. Um, there are a few, you know, that will, do their six years um, and then get out. You know, they they want to get their school paid for, or maybe they just want you know a little bit of um, workplace experience, a resume builder. It's good for all of that, but most people like to try and stay for twenty years to try and get a pension. Mm -hmm. Well, other than the, the periods of deployment or training, uh, these uh, these uh, soldiers are at their regular places of employment. That's correct, sir. So for most of our soldiers, 
um, they aren't full time. Most of them are what we call M day soldiers. And that's where they're only going to their one drill week in a month, two weeks in the summer. And then they have a civilian job that they go to, you know, Monday through Friday. So that's what I did for the first couple of years that I was in. Um, I was actually a full time college student. So I would, you know, go to school Monday through Friday. And then one week in a month, I would go to my drill. And then I actually worked at a daycare for a little bit as well. And then same thing, I would on my drill weekends, just go to drill. Well, that sounds really interesting. In terms of, uh, let's say variety of experience, uh, people maybe in technical fields or people maybe in laboring fields or maybe farmers uh, or maybe involved in the, the cyber uh, world. Uh, just give us a, uh, an outlook on the, the variety of uh, outside occupations your members have. Yeah, absolutely. So we have, you name it, we've got it here in the Vermont Army National Guard. So we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have mechanics, we have childcare providers, we have teachers, literally anything you can think of, we pretty much have somebody that does that on the civilian side. Um, so oftentimes on deployments, you see that a National Guard unit will do really well on a deployment because we are so diversified as far as our skill sets. So um, I'll use myself an ex as an example. I have a marketing degree, uh, but I was a diesel mechanic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had basically two very different skill sets, but that's what makes us even better because you never know what someone did on the civilian side or what they're doing on the civilian side that they can bring to a drill weekend or a deployment. That's amazing. And um, let's, let's get down to some of the details. Is, is there a age limit uh, for people uh, either joining or in the, the actual service? Yes, sir. So right now in order to enlist, we, uh, without a waiver, so without any exception, 17 to 35 years old. Those are, that's our eligible population. However, we do age waivers or exceptions to policy for all the way up to age, I've seen it as late as 48. So let's say that, you know, somebody has a specific degree, maybe, maybe they have, um, I don't know, uh, an environmental science degree. Right. And they wanted to focus on that and they decided that they didn't want to join the military until later on in life. Then we can do what's called an exception to policy. And our adjutant general, General Knight, can actually sign off on that and say, yes, you know, I want this person to enlist in our National Guard. Um, but it is a case by case basis. So you have to have, you know, a good reason you know, for joining later in life. But we do have those applicants um, and I have seen it happen multiple times. So that's for, you know, just basic enlistment. And then as far as um, oldest age, typically people don't stay after age 60. That's kind of the cutoff. Again, there are exceptions. If, you know, somebody is close to a 20 year retirement, they may make an exception to let them stay later. Okay, let's get into some of the... Uh... Uh, that, first of all, what, what about eligibility? Uh, so let's say I'm just walking in there and I'm asking questions about how do I join? Tell us about eligibility, physical, educational, age-wise, we just discussed. Tell us about that. Great question. So for eligibility, right, we already covered the age portion. For education, we require either a high school diploma or a GED. So either one of those will suffice, um, or at least some college. So if you don't have a high school diploma, but let's say you have, you know, 20 college credits, we can work with that as well. Um, so that's the education piece. Legal, so you can't have any major misconducts, right? So no felonies, that's a hard no for us, um, because there is a background check that you have to go through, and you have to be able to pass it. Um, if you have multiple DUIs, that's also, we can't work with that. There are some things that are waiverable. Let's say that something happened, you know, when you were 17 years old and now you're 30, you know, 17 you and 30 you are two very different people. 
Um, so we look at what we call the whole soldier or whole person concept, where yes, maybe somebody messed up when they were younger, but now, you know, they, they have a family or they earn their degree or they have a really good job. So we look at that on a case by case basis. And if it's something that we think, you know, is not going to be a repetitive issue, then we can offer, you know, a waiver for that or an exception to policy. So that's kind of our, our legal standards, our moral standards. Um, and then the physical. So this one gets a lot of people. Um, less than 14% of the current population is eligible for military service based on physical condition. So what I mean by that is if you have, you know, a history of asthma, um, if it was more than three years ago, then we can work with that. But if you're currently on an inhaler or taking an inhaler, then you can't join, right? And that's for the applicant's safety. Um, some other big ones are, you know, mental health. So if you're currently prescribed medication for mental health, whether it be anxiety, depression, um, that is also a, a permanent disqualifier for us. Realistically, anything that requires regular medication is usually a disqualifier because, right, if we're out at training or if we're on a deployment, you may not have access to that medication. And again, that's to keep, you know, the individual safe. Um, we don't want somebody to not have medication if they really need it. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the um, the physical requirements. Weight is also a, a big one now, right? We do have an obesity kind of epidemic going on. Um, and if you're overweight, that is also a disqualifier. Um, so that's kind of the physical portion. I'm trying to think if there's anything else for us that's a big um, issue. Those are really the top ones. Um, what I try to tell everyone though, our standards can change almost daily. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes if, if we have a lot of people that are joining, then they'll make the standards harder, right? And we'll be a little bit more picky. But if we, you know, if we anticipate a conflict or if we see a lot of people retiring, we may loosen our restrictions um, and offer more waivers. So the best thing for someone to do, if you're unsure, go talk to a recruiter. And then, you know, if standards change, maybe you're not eligible today, but maybe a month from now, a year from now, you are eligible. And then they can get a hold of you and, and you know, see if you're still interested. So the, the number one thing, make sure you talk to a recruiter. Mm -hmm. Now, this may seem like a strange question, but is there a citizenship requirement? There is. Actually, thanks for bringing that up, because that is a big one. Um, you have to be either a U.S. citizen or have an I-551 card. So, and to be honest, we've had a an influx of interested people that are I-551 card holders. That's and we, Correct, sir. Right. So that is lawful permanent residence. Some people call it a green card. Mm -hmm. um, and they can actually enlist and we will help expedite their citizenship. So that has been a really big benefit for a lot of our applicants because now they're not having to pay the fee to get their citizenship. Um, and we can actually help them get it within 90 days of enlisting, which is really, really fast. Um, because if you talk to some people, you know, they have to wait a year to get their citizenship, not when you join the guard. So that actually has been, um, we have seen an uptick in green card holders wanting to join the military. And not just for their citizenship. Um, example, we just had a young lady that we enlisted from Jamaica. She wanted to join because when she moved to America, this gave her a new life, right? She was able to do so many things here, um, go to school, get a great job, um, great health care, all of these things that she wasn't getting. And she wanted to give back because this was just such a good opportunity for her. That's great. Well, let's uh, just uh, explain briefly, what are some of the benefits of joining the Vermont? So, Act? yeah, so we have a ton of benefits and we'd be here all day if I listed them all out. But kind of our top three, one would be our free tuition program. So that is free tuition to any in-state school to include UVM. Um, we will pay 
free tuition. So if you commit to us, it is uh, for every one year of school, it's a two year service commitment. So if you do an eight year contract, you can get your four year degree completely paid for. Um, and we have a lot of people that do that. If you want to go to, let's say, Champlain or um, Norwich University, we will pay up to the UVM rate. So that is a good chunk of tuition that's taken away. And then I know that a lot of the private schools, they offer grants for service members. So if you use our tuition assistance plus, you know, whatever grants that they have, um, then you can go for free. One of the other education incentives that a lot of people don't know about is our Buxton Scholarship, which is a full ride to St. Michael's. Um, they'll pay for the entire thing. And you can apply for that right after you enlist into the Vermont Army National Guard. So that's a really good, good um, free tuition benefit as well. And then the other one, we just awarded two Minuteman scholarships to two, or sorry, one student from Essex High School and the other one graduated from Montpelier High School. But again, these are full ride scholarships. Um, both of them went to Syracuse and they are going to Syracuse completely free. Their room and board is paid for, their tuition is paid for, they get a book stipend, and then they also get paid for their drill weekend. So um, for those scholarships to Syracuse for a four-year scholarship, it was it was over $350,000 um, that the scholarship was worth. So that was pretty impressive to me. I mean, that's worth more than my house. So, um, you know, that was, that's a really good benefit that not a lot of people know that we have. Um, and then I would say our other two outside of, you know, education, our health insurance is really good. For a single soldier, it's about $50 a month. For a family, and you could have 10 kids, it's $250 a month. So it's really affordable. There's no copay. Um, and a lot of our soldiers that, you know, are traditional one drill week in a month, two weeks in the summer, and have a civilian job, a lot of them still opt into our health insurance because it's it's so affordable. Um, and then the last benefit would be the paid job training. So like I said, I was a diesel mechanic. The reason why I chose that was because I felt like it was a really good life skill and it was kind of a backup in case, you know, my degree in marketing wasn't going to take me somewhere. I at least had, you know, another skill set that I could fall back on. So our paid job training is definitely a great resource for for a lot of people. You know, um, we have, like I said before, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have plumbers, we have mechanics, and we offer all of those jobs in the military as well. So we're going to pay you to go to training and learn this skill set. And then a lot of those will actually convert to the civilian world. Um, I know that for anybody that wants to be a healthcare specialist or combat medic, they actually get their EMTB certification for going through our training. And the state of Vermont recognizes it. Um, another great one is our 88 Mike, which is a truck driver. That one, you can actually get your CDL from it, which, you know, your commercial driver's license, that's a couple thousand dollars and you don't have to pay for it. You just get your commander to sign off on the memo and you don't even have to take the driver test. So that's a pretty cool thing. That's great. Uh, I think uh, Vermont has had an outstanding uh, record in this. Uh, and I, I know uh, some, of, some of these people, but could you address uh, women in the military uh, <laughs> and how women have contributed and how uh, uh, particularly in Vermont, uh, women have been a major part of the National Guard. For sure. So I can tell you from personal experience, um, you know, like I said, I joined when I was 17 years old. It is a lot different from when I joined at 17. Mm -hmm. When I was 17, you know, I had never seen a female um, over the rank of like E5, so a sergeant. I had never seen that before. Um, now, fast forward, um, myself, I'm an E8, so there's only one more pay grade, you know, until I'm maxed out. So the opportunities for women in the Vermont Army National Guard have really grown over the years. Um, 
you, we now have a general in the Vermont Army National Guard, General Poirier, female. Um, my current battalion commander, Major Sarah Paletti, female. Um, we also have Sergeant Major Melinda Crosby, female. So there are a lot more women in leadership roles now, and it didn't used to be that way. And it's all because of the work that we have done to get here. Um, and, you know, in a lot of, I talk to a lot of civilian businesses in my job now, and there's always a conversation around women and pay inequality, right? We don't have that. I know exactly what my male counterparts make um, and we get paid exactly the same. Uh, so there's no gender, race, uh, religion. There's no discrimination when it comes to that. The army also does a really good job at putting policies in place to make sure that those things don't happen. And every single soldier that we enlist, they have to go through you know, sexual harassment uh, prevention training. They have to go through equal opportunity training. And I think a lot of people think, you know, when they think of the military, they're not thinking that we do those kinds of things, but that's what makes our culture so great because we have a zero tolerance policy and every soldier is aware of it from day one that they get the uniform. Um, and I will say that we're also very close knit so in my experience with the Vermont Army National Guard, um, my male counterparts look out for me like I'm their sister. And that's a real thing. Um, I would, you know, I have a daughter. She's four years old right now. I would be more than happy if she joined the Vermont Army National Guard one day because it's kind of a safe haven. Um, yeah, there's always going to be, you know, those bad actors in any profession, right? Right. We know bad teachers or bad doctors, there's always going to be those, but the the majority are really good people that all have really good backgrounds. You know, they're family people. And um, yeah, I've been very happy with my experience. Um, and I will say too that, you know, at moments in my career, I was a diesel mechanic. There weren't a lot of females in my, you know, profession. And then in recruiting, that was also a very male dominated workplace. So at times it could feel kind of lonely because I didn't always have somebody. Um, I didn't have another woman that I could confide in, but it has gotten so much better. Um, I look around right now, just in our recruiting battalion, and I have a number of strong women that I can reach out to and talk to. Um, and it has, like I said, and I'll keep repeating this, it has gotten so much better. There's always room for improvement, right? But overall, it has been a very positive experience for me. That's great. Well, we're getting near the end. And what I always like to do uh, at the conclusion of our interviews is, is ask, how can people uh, find out more? How can they get in touch? Yeah, great question. So First and foremost, um, we are online. So vtguard.com, if you look us up, you can find us that way. We also have an Instagram page. So Team Central, V-T-A-R-N-G, that's us. Um, that'll take you to one of my recruiters. And then um, a phone call. So my phone number is 802 8022743830. I've always got my phone on me. And if I can't get you the answer, then one of my recruiters can as well. That's great. And do you have an office? Uh, uh, an out we do. So we have three office locations across the state um, and all of our armories, but we have a storefront in St. Albans on Main Street. We also have a storefront at the Five Corners in Essex. And then we have a storefront in Rutland right across from the high school. That's great. I've seen uh, some of those. That's that's really fantastic. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Master Sergeant uh, Weissert, and uh, thank you for telling us all about the Vermont Army National Guard. And hopefully, we'll uh, hear from you in the future if you have any special projects or special programs you want to emphasize. Uh, yeah. So that is great. Thank you for being with us. And uh, this is Dennis McMahon uh, for Positively Vermont. Uh, our guest today was Master Sergeant Courtney Weiser of the Vermont 
Army National Guard. Thank you for watching.